Good morning and thank you for coming to our session, Connected Autonomous Vehicles Made Smart City at Traffic Light, and the consequence was. My name is Fabrizio Lorenzo, we work for IOTIX. So I want you to picture uh, a city where cars, autonomous or more traditional cars, interact with traffic lights, zebra crosses, um, road signs, buildings are where all the buildings are fully automated and that connect to, with each other or connect to utilities, uh, you know, electricity, building, the sewage system, everything works together harmoniously to provide a more reliable, uh, clean and thriving uh, experience for all the citizens. And, for example, you've got a car, you've got a traffic light, and let's imagine a car that has a mix of sensory data coming from the sensors and digital data coming from a traffic light. Um, the car detects a traffic light and receives from, from the, um, the computer of the, of, in, in the traffic light itself uh, information about the status. Lorenzo? Yep. So what you're about to see is a virtual representation of a, a smart city environment where a car detects that there is a, a traffic light that is uh, red. So the car waits until the traffic light turns green so that it's then uh, ready to move. So let's try and see how this works. Okay. So the car should now um, search for this traffic light. It will uh, recognize that the traffic light is red. It waits there because it recognized that the traffic light is red. Now, as soon as the traffic light becomes green, this is red, yellow, green, then the car, of course, will pass the traffic light. Thank you. Back to you, Fabrizio. OK. Um, so what you've seen is some interactions between two devices in the smart city. Well, wasn't that the promise of the Internet of Things, right? So you connect everything onto a network, maybe the Internet, maybe a private network. All these devices, whatever they are, can find each other, and by using some common protocols and f data formats, they can possibly, hopefully, interoperate with each other. Where well, there is a catch. If you count, uh, this is a statistics from IoT Analytics. There are, these are just the known public IoT platforms, most of which you can recognize the brand names, big brand hyperscalers, 620 and counting. Some come, some go. The problem is that, especially you know, the business model of each, of each one of these hyperscalers is to concentrate everything so, and provide essentially what they are, uh, independent silos. So the reality is that as long as those devices all belong to the same IoT platform or a consortium of IoT platform that decide to cooperate with each other, uh, effectively what you've got is a bunch of silos <coughs> that don't talk to each other. So as long as you stick to your one vendor, everything works. But you can imagine that that's not a, a scalable model for a smart city. So it's like having a, buying an Apple and only be able to phone people where it does another Apple phone, or be able to browse websites that are already hosted by Apple. Meh, doesn't work, right? So the key to enable a smart city, in our opinion, is enabling trusted autonomous interoperability. And in the next half an hour, 40 minutes, we're going to show you how we believe we can enable uh, a, 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 an environment where devices can talk to each other in a trusted manner autonomously without any intervention from developers, programmers, and exchange data with each other and interoperate. Before we move into the nitty-gritty details, I just want you to uh, kind of think a little bit more about what we believe a smart city is. So initially, you know, you might think about, okay, well, smart city is, is a place where there are loads of smart devices. Well, if that was the case, you know, count on what you got in your pocket, every city in the world would be smart because it's full of smartphones. For us, the key is not about how smart each individual device is, rather how interoperable any device is with any other device in the surrounding area. 
it's you know, captured in Metcalf's, Met, Metcalf's law. Metcalf, this is, uh, if you're familiar with that, it's around the uh, early 80s. Uh, what Metcalf postulated that the value of a network is not on the presence of each node in the network, but how each node can communicate with any other node. Metcalf came from a telco industry. And if there ever is a, a measure, a number that's, that, um, that captures how smart the city is, then that number will grow on the square of the number of devices in the city itself. So as the more each device can interoperate with any other device in the city, the smarter the city is on a quadratic, um, on a quadratic curve. So trusted autonomous interoperability. So what do we mean with uh, interoperability? So, you know, you can find and Google it, there are many of these representations. This is a stack that is a layer cake uh, stack that represents what interoperability is. So initially, and what we're claiming, we're postulating it for a smart city, in order for it to work, you must implement technical interoperability and organizational interoperability. Well, technical is all about, the, you know, uh, software systems to talk to each other. Organizational is organizations to uh, work with each other, change the way they possibly um, uh, work internally, their business processes, in order to uh, accommodate uh, new players coming in. So from a transport point of view, this is essentially you know, enable, enabling two devices to talk to each other, to transfer bytes from one end to the other. Read interoperability is all about, okay, I got some bytes, can I read them, can I parse them? So this is all about standardizing on uh, file formats or data formats. Read JSON, XML, um, I don't know, CSV files, whatever data format you want. Understand is where things start getting a little more interesting. So you got a device, it transfers, let's say it transfers some data in CSV files, in a CSV format. On the other end, the receiving devices must understand what each column on, the, on that um, uh, payload is, what each row represents, so that it can understand, understand is in the semantics of it, the meaning of that uh, value, understand which each cell of that um, payload um, um, means in order for it to react. Then you move into the organizational. That's the car that decides when it receives the, re the, the green from, um, from the traffic light to capture some insights. Oh, well, I need to stop or I can go. And act is the action of moving towards. And you can scale it at the organizational level because you know, uh, organizations need to encode into the software of the device, of the car in, in, in this case, uh, reactions on whatever data feed coming, are coming from uh, other devices. So obviously security and trust permeates every layer. You can't, um, you can't have interoperability unless there is trust on what the data that you receive from anywhere else, and you receive that in a secure manner. That goes at every single layer. So how do we do it? Well, there are six, conceptually six pillars, any architecture that provides or enables trusted autonomous interoperability sits on. Virtualization, sovereignty, symmetry, decentralization, semantics, and federation. Now, we're going to talk about this quickly to build up on the actual demo itself. Um, so let's imagine that we have an overlay from place somewhere that is able to receive or send data to the devices into the smart city. What we're going to do is build the whole stack, interoperability stack, with security and trust on that overlay. Virtualization is all about representing in, into this overlay a virtual representation of the device itself. The reason why, we, and that we call that uh, representation a digital twin. If you are in, in IoT or you know in the industrial IoT. Digital twins are becoming very, very uh, popular in the past well, probably six, seven, uh, ten years. In this case, what a digital twin for us represents, and imagine a digital twin of the car, which is a virtual representation in this overlay of the car, is a combination of metadata, data identity, and behavior. 
metadata is some um, data about the device itself. For in the case of a car, it could be the model, uh, the brand, the, the manufacturer, something that um, describes what that specific device is. Data is all about the internal status of this uh, device. So the speed, for in the case of the, of the car, the distance from some obstacle, anything that represents the current runtime status of the, of the device itself. Identity is the need of the, 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 um, the functionality of having that device uniquely identified across the environment. And behavior is something that essentially translates what the, the, the actual physical world is into whatever manages the, the actual status of the digital twin. We'll see some example later. Um, sovereignty and semantics are key in this. Semantics, as we were saying earlier, is related to how we model data and metadata. Modeling using semantics enable whoever intera interacts with that device, with that digital twin, to understand what data means. Is the example earlier of the um, CSV file, of the CSV uh, data format. And sovereignty is key as well in terms of security and, um, and, um, uh, and trust. You can imagine a car uh, driving in any city in the world. You can't expect to have some sort of a third party entity anywhere that is able to guarantee the trust that that device uh, needs, to, um, uh, needs to provide. So the identity must be sovereign. The devices must own their own identity, and there must be some mechanisms for that identity to be maybe verified, to be proved, but the identity has to sit into the device itself. Symmetry is another key concept. Uh, what we're claiming here is that in order for two devices to interoperate with each other, they don't do that directly, but they do by means of their digital twin. So this is a, the, the twin, in essence, acts as a client compared to another twin or as a server to provide the data. Any interaction between any two given devices only happens on that layer, which obviously is also a, um, a feature for security, because if you secure that layer and you implement a trust model within that layer, anything can go underneath. Now, imagine multiple organizations coming in into this environment, each one providing their own ways of doing uh, digital twins. You can start seeing uh, how a federated model makes perfect sense. Each organization, in here represented by a circle and uh, by a color, comes in with its own set of twins <laughs> and makes them available into this environment, into this network. Uh, with the right you know, access control rules and policies that make sure that um, any other uh, organization can see whatever is allowed to see. But you see a, a federated model where organizations come in and decide to cooperate with each other makes perfect sense. And it's, a, again, a symmetrical model where any in, um, uh, communication across this organization only ha occurs onto that, onto that uh, control layer. And finally, uh, decentralization. Uh, if you kind of look top down on what we just discussed, there is no central authority uh, that guarantees that, that any communication across these uh, and organizations, or in fact, that the digital twin to digital twin layer exists. It's just a model of, for example, how the web works. You come in, you deploy your web server, your content is available to everybody who, who, who is bothered to go and read it. You can come, you can go. No, but no, um, no third party needs to be uh, disturbed or trusted or uh, scaled or whatever uh, in order for you to participate uh, into, this, into this model. So it's essentially a peer-to-peer -peer model where each peer is fully sovereign, fully independent, and can, can come in and go as they see fit. So next, let it down. How do we do it? Well, let's, let's imagine a car, uh, car X over there, and its own digital twin. Um, how do we implement it? So if you unpack what we just said, you'll see that there is some identity. There's a runtime, in this case, a runtime that runs on the car itself, where the identity is managed, so the whole PKI infrastructure. 
and some behavior. The behavior of the car that says, I am a digital twin. These are the set of parameters that I want the entire world to know about me. We're just going to see some example in, in, in a second. So that, that, that runtime that runs that behavior, that essentially translates the real to the virtual, uh, sits in there. Next, you want another runtime where with topics are queued, so inputs and outputs, where data can go and flow. Right? So this function here can take some data from the, from the device and decide to broadcast that to everybody or to decide to um, uh, listen for commands or data that is in input from other devices. So some runtime where those ports can exist and can be essentially secured. Uh, and la the last piece is a um, bit of storage where this function here publishes the metadata. Imagine the yellow pages back in the good old days. You publish into yellow pages who you are, what you do, what, what data you can provide, or what data you are able to receive. So any other digital twin in that environment can find you, bind to you, and essentially understand you. Semantically modeled metadata. Access control rules sit in there as well just to provide that essentially firewall around uh, the twin that or logical firewall around the twin that implements access control. Finally, where do I put that, that, that environment? It doesn't really matter. Uh, in our case, in the demo for today, that environment is uh, on the cloud, but you know, it can be at the edge, on a gateway at the edge, on-premise, whatever it makes sense, as long as the northbound is connected to the network where the smart city is. So the important understand the distinction here is that there is a logical line that separates the real and the virtual. The top end is where the, in, the entire interoperability stack gets implemented. The bottom end is entirely down to the nitty gritty of the implementation for the specific device. <laughs> Finally, and that's the example we're going to see, um, as we said earlier, a, a, you can have a traffic light with its own twin up there with topics and queues. And on the other end, we've got the car, which acts as a client, which subscribes or can send commands. So you can, you can see how up there you have a symmetrical model where client and server coexist to, um, to essentially um, talk to each other, interoperate with each other. So now another bit of action. Lorenzo, you want to take over? Sure. Thank you, Fabrizio. Um, yeah, sorry. Let me just do this. So what you will see now is uh, the same car that uh, moves back and forth for uh, five times uh, with incremental speed. This car will be virtualized into what we call uh, a digital twin. Um, so this car, why we, we want to do that? Because uh, once we have this connection between uh, real object and virtual object, any, anything that the car does, anything that the real object does, can be reflected to its twin. Why we want to do that? Because, of course, we can have other twins that may want to receive this data, if they want to receive this data, and if they are willing, sorry, if they are allowed to receive this data. Okay? So this car, as I said, will generate some uh, data in terms of uh, speed. Furthermore, this car has sensors. And in particular, we want to use uh, proximity sensors. Okay? So we can uh, uh, generate some data in terms of the distance from this car uh, to a detected object. Okay? Um, so what I'm going to show you is uh, from, uh, from a terminal, the execution of uh, a connector of, uh, um, of this car twin that uh, will be created, and uh, it will uh, start sharing some data. Okay? So let's have a look uh, how this works. Okay. 
Okay, so as you can see, the, the digital twin of this car has been created. So this is the ID of uh, the car twin. Uh, I have started two threads uh, that uh, uh, will eventually share distance data and speed data, and it's now waiting for my signal, because before starting producing data from the real object, I want to show you from another terminal at the bottom the execution of another connector written uh, in, uh, in Java that uh, what uh, will do is to create another twin which we will simply call follower twin. Then it will search for the car twin. If found, it will describe this twin. It will describe its feeds that will generate data and eventually wait for new data to be received by the twin of the car. Let's have a look. Okay, so let's start from here. So a new twin has been created, a follower's twin. As you can see, this is the ID of the follower twin. It started to search for twins, and in particular, we want to find the twin of the car, which apparently it found here. So as you can see, this is the twin description, and in particular, this is the twin ID of the twin that uh, it found. And as you can see, this ID ends with BSE, which is exactly the same as the twin of the car that we created there, BSE. Okay? Then it starts describing this, uh, this twin. So this is the uh, semantic description of the twin of the car. Then it starts describing the feeds of the twin that will produce eventually some data. So we have two feeds. One is, uh, let me show you here, uh, one is the ID distance, and one has as ID speed, okay? So then it, uh, it returned the research responses from other spaces, but as soon as it finds the, uh, the, the twin that we are looking for, it stops. And now it is essentially waiting for new data to be received by the twin of the car. So as soon as I start producing some data, we will see the car moving, so the real object moving, and therefore producing data. The twin of the car will share this data, and the follower twin on the other side uh, will be able to receive this data. Okay, so as you can see, some data has been generated in terms of speed and distance. The same data has been received on the follower side. Okay, speed and distance. So this is the connection between real objects and virtual objects. Now I want to show you um, some code. Uh, let's go here. Uh, here. What I want to show you now is the code. Actually, before showing the code, I want to show you the amount of twins that we can find. Um, it's here, right? Uh, where is the? It's bad. Okay. No, it's what I want to show you now is uh, the amount of twins that you can find within a space if we were to search for twins, for example, in, uh, in London, okay? So I am here, let's try and find uh, some twins in uh, London. It's still loading, so any pin that you see here represents a twin in London, and uh, if we focus on uh, one of them, for example, the bike point model, there are a couple of things to highlight here. First of all, any twin that you see is uh, semantically described. So we use semantic web technologies like uh, RDF, OWL, and, uh, and Sparkle. 
but also it's important to highlight the decentralized architecture of where these twins live. Because all of these twins live in a, a network of decentralized different spaces. Okay? Now, let's have a look at uh, um, some code. And the code that I want to show you in particular is referring to the first demo that I showed when there was the car um, recognizing that the traffic light was red. And as soon as the traffic light turns green, then the car is ready to move. So let's have a look how this uh, is implemented. So this code is uh, in, uh, in Python. And let's go directly to the main. Uh, um, is the font uh, big enough? Yes. OK, so first of all, we want to uh, create a car connector object that has a constructor that will initialize uh, some variables, but also it will initialize the, the robocar. Then we want to start defining some metadata property, as I discussed. In particular, among all of these properties, one of the most important ones is this property here that is essentially defining that the twin that we are using defines uh, this property. This property is a public ontology related to cars. As you can see, it's schema.org slash car. Okay? Then uh, we will define some feeds uh, with regards to speed and uh, distance. In particular, speed. And uh, with speed, we don't simply want to share row numbers. Okay? We want to share semantically described uh, data. So by doing that, we can define that the speed, the numbers, will be floating numbers. Then we want to say that these numbers are not simply numbers, but they are referring to kilometers per hour. But in particular, we want to say that through the use of the ontology of kilometers per hour, so that everyone in the world agrees about what we are talking about. And the same we do with distance. We want, to we want to send integer numbers, but also we want to say that those numbers are in centimeters. So the distance is in centimeters. And again, we want to use the semantic, sorry, the ontology of centimeters so that everyone has a common understanding of what centimeters mean. OK? Then, uh, OK, another interesting property is the fuel type, which again, what does it mean fuel type? Exactly what is defined by this public ontology. And the fuel type, in this case, is electric. What does electric mean? Exactly what is defined by this ontology. Then we will create our car twin. And in particular, we want to start this twin in uh, London, for example, so we want to make it based in London, so I will specify a London lat and a London longitude. We will add all of the properties that we defined earlier, and we want to have these two feeds that uh, we mentioned earlier, speed and distance. I will then start two threads that will essentially wait for new data to be produced and eventually share it by the use of this twin. And this is the main while true loop, which what it does is to search for smart entities, and I will show you later how, and then subscribe to the twins that we are interested in. So the search smart entity, what it does is essentially to search for twins within a specific location in this particular example. And we want to search for twins in London by specifying latitude, longitude, and a radius in kilometers. This search will return some twins, so a list of twins. This list of twins will be passed to the next function, so subscribe to twins of interest, because what we said, we are only interested in the twin of the traffic light, of course. So what we will do is to scan this list, so any twin found in that uh, search. Then uh, we will scan the twin properties of all the twins found because we want to find uh, 
the twin of the traffic light. In particular, I know that the twin of the traffic light has a label, and the label is traffic light the box. So if uh, this twin, the twin of the traffic light has been found, then what do we want to do? We want to wait for data. In this case, we want to wait for data of the traffic light. Okay? So the wait for data, what it does is to continuously wait for new data to be received. And the traffic light will generate essentially only one type of data, which is the traffic light signal. The traffic light signal can be either red, red-yellow, yellow, or, of course, otherwise it's green. If it's red, red-yellow, or yellow, then there is a stop signal, so the car, of course, will not move, or at least will approach the traffic light, and then it will stop. As soon as the traffic light sends a green signal, then the car is ready to move. Okay? Now, uh, do we want to try it again and see uh, let's if it works? Okay. Okay, so let's try and uh, do it again. So I can show you exactly some data produced by the twin of the car. So I will uh, go here, here. Okay, and regarding the traffic lights, I can do that here. Okay, so the car will now try and uh, find uh, all the twins uh, based in London, and as soon as uh, uh, the traffic light has been found, go next to the traffic light, wait for the traffic light to become green, and then you can move. So we are initializing the, uh, the robot car. Then, uh, oops, didn't stop. <laughs> Let, let's try it again, because sometimes these sensors do not work properly. OK. Okay, so the traffic light has been, uh, uh, it has received a red signal by the traffic light. Of course, the traffic light, once uh, it sends red, it's, it's still red. It keeps sharing the distance of, of the car, because that's something that we can keep sharing. And we are now waiting for the, uh, for the car's twin. Um, okay, now if I turn the traffic light red, and yellow, the car received that the, that the traffic light sent a red-yellow signal, so it, it still needs to wait, even though you can prepare to start. As soon as the traffic light becomes green, <laughs> the crash occurs. It crashed. <laughs> didn't receive the green signal. Anyway, as soon as the traffic light <laughs> sends the green signal, it should receive it there, and then it should move. OK? Thank you, Fabrizio. OK. But it's back to you. Right. Okay. Where was it? It died. Demo artist again. Yeah. We I mean, have so many moving parts. <laughs> so what we've seen is how we've modeled some of these real objects as virtual objects, specifically digital twins in this environment, uh, in this, where we've Im implemented interoperability, uh, an interoperability layer that enables any device to intercommunicate with any other device. From now, what we've seen is a narrow view. What we call it is an inside-out view of uh, of the world. Is the, is the view from the car perspective or the view from the traffic light perspective? 
There is another, another way of interpreting what we just saw, which is an outside in. So imagine you have structured yourself out, and what is that you see is considering those small bits of storage that contain semantically modeled data. What you see is a cloud of federated metadata stores. Now, specifically, this is relevant because uh, Lorenzo mentioned we use semantic web technology, so concepts like URIs, linked data, and essentially uh, the concept of uh, knowledge graph. All these federated uh, stores can be seen as a federated distributed knowledge graph, where each node is the metadata of a single digital twin. And they are all interrelated with each other, or interlinked with each other. You know, technologies like URIs, um, JSON-LD, uh, Turtle, RDF, specifically RDF, the way we, you know, we chose to model in this case, uh, the metadata is by using RDF and RDFS. Um, query language like Sparkle, and so on. So in essence, you can see this knowledge graph, and this is essentially what you can see as a smart city as. A set of nodes, a set of nodes into this distributed graph, where each node is, for example, the car, and you have two type of, uh, two type of links. You can have semantic links, for example, if you model the engine on the car as a digital twin, you can semantically link it to the car itself, for example, installed in, or you can uh, semantically link the car with the factory if you have a digital twin of the factory made by. But you also have another graph, which is the graph of the runtime data flows, how data is flowing from one twin to the other. So, for example, the car is following that, the traffic light. It's interesting because then things that you can do are the following. Let's see if I can find it. Oops, oops. Here. And we go down. So, this is a small Java driver that runs Sparkle. Okay, in this case, what I'm, what I'm you can't see it. Let's see if I can make it bigger. Oops. Control Shift Plus. Control Shift Plus, no. Um, no, doesn't matter. Um, does anyone remember the key binding on IntelliJ or not to make the... You can just change your fingers. And does that work? No. No. <laughs> uh, let's see. Why is he not working? No. Control plus. <laughs> All right. Uh, view. I think you can go directly to uh, maybe appearance. But it's on view. Yeah, view. Uh, appearance. Syntax presentation. The first one. Two windows. And the presentation mode. Mm. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, that's embarrassing. Right, uh, this is a Spark, oh, Sparkle query. Hopefully you can see it. Don't know, don't, you don't have to know Sparkle, but you know, imagine like the ability like running some query language on the knowledge graph that enables you to essentially retrieve whatever the knowledge graph uh, contains. In this case, um, show me all the cars that you know about and show me of the cars their specific labels. So if I can run now exit from here. Oops. <laughs> exit presentation mode. Um, run. Okay, let's see. Run. The query. So I'm running the query. As you can see, I'm receiving data from all the spaces into the network. Some of them don't have any binding, any data. But at some point, I should be able to find the data. And I found, actually, we didn't mention we have uh, one of the great benefits of having digital twins is that you don't need to necessarily bind the twin to a real object. You can swap the real object with a simulated object. So we've simulated 
uh, I don't know, maybe hundreds. One of the twins. One Heart of the twins, twins spread in London. They're moving around, and uh, um, uh, and that's the outcome of that query, essentially uh, showing you the, each one of these cars and uh, the label. The point here is that you can see this knowledge graph and um, access it to do any 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 sort of um, interesting querying around. Uh, with that, let's move on to this again. So yeah, uh, and there is, there is more. Um, on a, with this model where you essentially create an overlay that implements the entire interoperability layer across devices into the smart city, um, um, you can start thinking about architectural patterns that you can build applications on. So one of these is, for example, uh, a federated data mesh. Data mesh is, you know, these days is becoming quite popular, but the, the, the concept of data mesh is always inwards. It's always related to your organization, how you can mesh the data within your organization. With a model like this, where you have federated organizations coming together and exposing data, you can imagine how you can mesh, you can provide a mesh across multiple organizations. Um, the other is data-centric architectures. Uh, if you think about that, the digital twin expresses essentially uh, as a data source or, that, or as a data sink. Data-centric architecture that's promoted by people in sem from semantic arts is essentially the concept of decoupling any business logic, any applications from the actual data in itself. So the data that represents the digital twin, either in the form of the metadata or the streaming data, represents the entire um, data model of your organization, the entire data model of your device, irrespective of how you want to use. And that also promotes reuse because, you know, in this case we have a simple, um, a simple um, um, use case for a car that wants to drive and stop on a traffic light. But that becomes quite interesting into the next um, architectural model, which, which is that of the multi-agent systems. Um, the concept of multi-agent system is where you, a, car, a car in itself has a, has a goal, right? So, for example, uh, you know, I want to go from A to B. But in the context of multi-agent system, you can imagine each car as a single node into this, uh, as a, a single agent into this um, system that, that cooperates with any other car to provide a common and shared goal. So, for example, that could be reduction of CO2 emissions on a specific uh, neighbor of, uh, of, a, of, of a smart city. So the way the car communicates with each other, the way they reroute themselves could, for example, optim optimize traffic on specific areas and as a consequence reduce CO2 emissions. Um, so you, you, you can imagine how um, you can have applications that not only see the world as a single, uh, as a single device to device, but as a cooperation of those devices that work together. I uh, think, oh yes, these old design patterns, we have accumulated most of them in our websites, but um, that's just that. And to uh, conclude, um, trusted autonomous interoperability, that for us is the key to enable smart city, in actual fact, can be extended to any other um, set of use cases, our operational use cases to analytics use cases, or from internal things type of use cases to data management use cases. So the, the model based on you know, sovereignty, uh, virtualization, symmetry, uh, and so on, is what we believe the key for this set of use cases that are essentially evolve, can evolve uh, over time um, without having to necessarily establish any standards. So this, we see this as a standard approach. I think we've done. Thank you for uh, your patience and listening to us. And you know, we managed to run thank some time. Car. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Carl. Um, anyway, so we've got five minutes left. Uh, if you have any questions, any comments, um, please feel free. Uh, if not, reach out to us um, even after we're here around. Try to rerun the cars later to see if you're know, interested to see how the, the even more details how you want. So over to you. Any questions? Yeah? So, so the reason for the silos for the big companies is just because the data is gone by the internet and they want to keep it to themselves. That's, that's where. 
So, yeah, uh, yeah, some companies uh, make money not necessarily from the debt in itself, they make money for the storage that they sell to store that data or the compute that sell to the process that data. But yes, you're right. Um, the point is that um, you, you, have to see, you have to see this set of use cases here from two point, from two point of view. The point of view of the organization itself, I have my, to satisfy my shareholders, right? So whatever that means. But you also see from the outside in. So global problems like CO2 emission reductions can be solved by a single company. Some, sometimes these companies are, are forced to share data. Or sometimes, and this is a trend that you can see if you are into data management, uh, the, the concept of locking the data in, uh, you'll see that the, 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 the risk of letting the, the, um, the, the risk of competitive disadvantages that you have by sharing the data are far less than the one of the miss, missed opportunities that you have to have business with other partners. Imagine supply chain set of use cases. The point is, uh, we are living in a global world. Yes, you have to satisfy your uh, shareholders, but most of the use cases that we see coming, up, coming in require organizations to cooperate. And the way you can uh, cooperate is by sharing data. There's another thing, you don't necessarily have to share raw data. In that interoperability layer, sharing can happen on any, on any level, right? You can share information, which is process data, or you can share insights, as in the form of events. Okay, so the, or in fact, we have, a, we have some patterns that enable you to share code. Rather than having to send you some information to you that you can process locally, you ship to me the code, I run the code on my data and send you the results. There are various patterns that you can implement uh, at any layer uh, of that interoperability <laughs> stack, depending on, on what use cases you, you, might, you might have. Finally, there are also considerations around, obviously, GDPR or legal considerations. You might be willing to share data with someone, but if that sits in a separate um, legislative kind of uh, uh, environment, you might not be able to do it. Imagine, imagine uh, sharing the context of defense use cases. Does that answer the question? Any other Any more? questions? This is a demo use case of the concept of interoperability across um, uh, different organizations that want to cooperate. Smart City is cool because it allows us to run uh, bots. Um, but as I say, your, um, you know, we, we, in our company, our company is called IOTIX. That's what we do. That's uh, the middleware that enables interoperability. But the use cases can vary. Uh, we're not speci specifically focused on smart cities. We have use cases in the utility, in defense, um, because the, the, the concept can be um, uh, transferred across various, uh, various set of uh, market verticals and, and set of use cases. Yeah, so that's, that's what I was saying earlier with the concept of sovereign identity, okay? Um, what you're talking about is how do I verify whether the data that I receive from the digital twin actually is emitted by the underlying uh, device that I'm seeing there. That's pr called provenance. So uh, it's um, with the technology that we've implemented in this specific case, there, may, there are many other ways you can you can implement it, but they, you can cryptographically prove that the data that you receive actually come from the underlying. And we've done work with uh, chip manufacturers where the identity, that sovereign identity can actually, and, and, um, and uh, um, drivers that essentially require the, the function calls to encrypt or uh, sign payloads are actually on chip and that is actually the, 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 you know, the, the, um, the way you, you, you implement um, provenance, essentially. 
Yeah, what do we have on that? Um, it, can you uh, can you search and filter devices then um, uh, based on the certificate uh, certificate provider or something like that? So the concept of, um, as you were saying earlier, is sovereignty. So you can search on anything that the digital twin decides to expose. So if a digital twin decides to be found using, I don't know, his public key or wh whatever criteria, what he has to do is provide metadata, semantically described metadata, that reflects the, the search parameters you want, to, uh, you want to be found as or with. I mentioned earlier that only the twins that are, of course, interested in receiving the data will receive the data, but more importantly, are allowed to receive that data. Because, of course, not all the twins may be allowed to receive that type of data. Any more questions? OK. Well, thank you very much. If you, you know, uh, any, any other question later, come and find us. We're around today and tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you.